It happened because I was out of work and I had bills to pay and Charlie Bronson knew that that was the case. And he said, why don't we have lunch in the commissary in MGM? And maybe we'll see what happens. So we went together um, and we sat down and I had a sandwich which was named after Sammy Davis Jr. or something. And I was sitting there in this you know, when you're a kid from Glasgow and you've watched the movies growing up and all of a sudden you're in this, you know, cathedral, which is the MGM commissary with all the pictures on the wall and the people walking around that you've seen on the screen. Um, I just was carried away. Anyway, um, I met Sam Rolfe at that, at that lunch. And Sam Rolf nodded, said hello. And I think out of that, the, the, that, that seed was planted with Sam Rolf and Peter Fields was another. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was then called by my agent, which was still Paul Conner. And he, I, he said, you, you've been offered three television series. One is to play Alexander the Great, another is to play Judas Iscariot, of course, because I've just done Judas in The Greatest Story Ever Told, which again is another tale. <laughs> and uh, the other is a thing called Solo, which um, is based to a certain extent on um, the Bond books. Or no, it's based like the Bond books. It wasn't called Solo in the end because there's a character in a Bond book called Mr. Solo and there was a conflict that it became the man from Uncle. The apocryphal story that I have heard, and it may be true, but uh, is that Sam and um, Sam Rolf and Norman Felton were, got, were asked to do a series by MGM. And so they say, well, let's talk about merchandising. We need a gun, we need a badge, we need a lunch pail, we need X, Y, and Z. Um, what fits all that bill? And that's how the man from Uncle was sort of created around that and the spy story. They'd already come up with the idea of, of spies and, you know, bond type material. But uh, that's how it began. First year was fantastic. Second year was very good. Third year, it began to dwindle because Bob lost his enthusiasm, I found. Um, he'd already done it, come right off a series called The Lieutenant. And I think he was getting a little tired. At the same time, we switched various producers. And there is a rule in comedy particularly. You don't make jokes about jokes. You don't create farce about farce. It stands alone. And the minute you push to the next step and try and make fun of farce or fun of a joke, the whole thing falls flat. You, you've got to be true to yourself and stick to the one element. And we began to take farcical situations and then have people, directors who came in and would perform them farcically. And of course, it doesn't make any sense at all. So the quality of the the very similitude, if you like, um, just dropped off. And to this day, I haven't been told that the series is cancelled. And all of it, 50 years ago. Um, that's the way things operated. I mean, you, you never knew. It just, we, we would go home, a script would come, we'd do it. And there'd be a pause, and then two pages would come, and then there's finally nothing came through the mail. I think I read in the paper somewhere that there were no more articles afoot. So that's how you learned of the cancellation. Oh yes, I never learned. Nobody's ever called me. I was oh, by the way, it's canceled. When we interviewed Robert Vaughn, he had mentioned that the pilot shot November of 1963, um, right when President Kennedy was assassinated. Oh, no, I wanted to know if you. Yeah, if you had any recollection of that time shooting the pilot, and I think there were reshoots as well, because there was some recasting done from the original pilot. 
Well, I sort of remember it because what happened to me was, first of all, the part of India Koryakin was that big. Right. It was five lines or something. And he had a collection of jazz records under his bed. That was it. Um, I shot the scene. And I took a shower at time one morning. And I was getting out of the shower. For some reason or other, Jill slammed the door of the shower. And it shattered and cut me. And as a result of that, I went and I had a shot of penicillin. And I swelled up to, you know, you can die. And they fill you full of neutropen. So I went into St. Joseph's Hospital. And I was there for like 10 days. I wasn't needed anymore in that show. And the next one, they didn't need me right away. In the second show, I may not have been in it even. I mean, it may have been. But the part of Ilya was so little and so nothing. Um... I got better. I haven't had any penicillin since. I was in Italy and I told the Italian doctor, what do I do to it? And he said, you have to have it tattooed on your butt. <laughs> no penicillin. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to shoot you. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so yeah, it, it grew in, in a way that the writers saw the, the relationship between um, Leo G. Carroll, myself, and Bob, and they, they, it grew. They, they wrote stories that worked well. We would have each week in the beginning, the initial impulse was to have a pretty girl who was taken out from a suburban environment and put into royalty or high society, and Robert would be the catalyst. Really had nothing to do with it. And that paled very quickly. And so they began to bring in big stars. Jack Palance, I remember particularly, and mm -hmm. so many. I mean, the list is extraordinary. 